Greetings, programs and users. It is time once again for another episode of Old Nerds Drinking. I am John Patrick, the Master Control Program. Here with me again is... Rojan. Yes, that is me. It wow, is. that came out really strange. <laughs> uh, Anyways. Uh, and we are Old Nerds, and we are drinking. Rojan, Rojan, what are you drinking tonight? I am drinking Long Island iced tea. It is not a homemade Long Island iced tea. It is a pre-made Long Island iced tea in a can. It is shit. It is made by Club Tales. It is a malt beverage, which means that it's like a, uh, it's kind of like a wine cooler kind of thing. But I don't drink very often anymore. And this was in my cooler, and I said, hey, let's you know, let's let's pull this out and put it to use. Um, it's a Long Island iced tea. Its sole purpose is to get you fucked up. Yeah, but I don't drink much anymore. I mean, I'll drink like with you or something like that, or I'll have a beer with my buddies and stuff. But that's something I really only do in the summertime in the backyard around the fire or when I'm hanging out with you. But the rest of the time, I really don't drink that much. And I kept looking at this in the fridge and I'm like, I'm going to throw those out. And I'm like, no, because I'm going to be recording with John. And I don't, you know, I, I, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of prerequisite that I have some kind of alcohol here. But right. I do have a bunch of mead still sitting here. So. Um. In honor of the fact that last weekend was the Kentucky Derby, I have made myself a mint julep, the official drink of the Kentucky Derby. Really? I do like a mint julep. I do like a good one. So, let's see. And today, um, I got to open up my uh, 42 emotional support tabs on my phone. (laughs) For pour one out? I have an unusual pour one out that I would like to throw into the mix, too. Uh, We got a couple. So, first off, we're we're pouring one out for Bernard Hill. The uh, actor from Titanic, Lord of the Rings, and a bunch of other... He's that guy in the background. but he Yeah, uh, he's one of those that guys. Yeah. Right. Uh, he played Theoden, which is honestly my... F- like, after Sam, like, my favorite character in the Lord of the Rings movies is Theoden. Like, he gets all the best lines. He has the coolest looking armor. Um, in my opinion, probably one of the best swords in the Lord of the Rings movie. Um he did have a really cool sword. He did. <laughs> Herigrim, the sword of the horse lord. Because um, you know it's cool when your sword has a name. Uh, so, yes, he passed away at the age of 79. But to Theoden, uh, in the halls of the horse lords, we salute you. I also have another one I would like to th- throw in here. This yes. is an odd one, but this is something that will resonate with you as well. Me and you are both fans of the Props to History guy. Oh, yeah. Um he uh, he has got had his ass kicked in the last, I'd say, month or so. He came down with COVID. He got over COVID. And then he did a video on TikTok today about his uh, his dog. He had to put his dog down. His dog, I think, was, oh, God, I think it was 15 years of a 15-year-old beagle. So he had to put his puppy down. And both me and you have both had to put pets down. And it sucks. It really does. And me and you are both big fans of props to history. So I, I know this guy's never going to hear it, but hopefully if anybody's listening to the show, if you have an access to TikTok or any of the other places that this guy does his things, um, me and you are both big fans of props to history because he takes he talks about cool movie props and where right. they came from and how they were made. And when you got your um, lightsaber flash or your lightsaber um, flash, camera flash, I remember he specifically responded to your post on TikTok. So I just felt it appropriate that we, you know, give him a, a poor one out for him and his his puppy that he had to put down. Yeah, I've actually uh, interacted with him on a, when he does, like, lives a couple of times. So, I mean, like, I'm not saying we're, like, internet buddies or anything. No, but yeah. yeah, yeah, I get it. Um, I want to interview him. Oh, dude, I'm I would sure love, I would love to. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm willing to put the work into it, but, you know. Yeah, because <clears throat> uh, especially his hook, he's got to hook up to Adam Savage, so that just puts us one step closer to Adam Savage. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, also, sadly, we need to pour one out for Lower Decks, because it was just announced oh, yeah. that Season 5 of Lower Decks will be the last season of Lower Decks. You bastards at Paramount+. Plus. I hate you. I have a theory about that, but we'll talk about that after we uh, after we do the clink and the, and the toast. Well, while there's a car driving by, I apologize if anybody can hear it. I got my window open here. We do a clink. Anyways. Okay, here we go. Three, two, two one. one. Oh. Uh, so, yeah, Lower Decks. Um, I, it's, I'm going to, again, this is one of those shows. Um, we did, I did this with The Expanse. You were like, watch The Expanse, watch The Expanse. And I finally got around to it. And then I finally got around to watching Lower Decks. 
And I was a person that's like, you know, I really don't want comedy. And I, I, I don't discriminate on sci-fi. I, I'm a big fan of Firefly, Star Wars, Star Trek. Um, as long as, you know, Farscape, I, uh, Battlestar Galactica, I don't have... I'm one of those people that has the coexist bumper sticker, you know, if, if I could, that has, it's made out of all the different things from all the different sci-fi shows. Yeah. But I finally got around to watching lower decks and I'm like, shit, this is actually really damn funny. It was a really good show. And now they're bringing it to an end, which is kind of strange to me. There's a couple of reasons I think they're doing it. Number one, the female actor that does the voice on that show, uh, Mariner, I believe her name is. Uh, Tawny, uh, Tawny Williams, I believe is her name. Yes, Tawny Williams. Uh, she was on, they, they did the Strange New Worlds crossover, which was fantastic. They did live action Strange New Worlds on Strange, uh, the live action uh, Lower Decks on Strange New Worlds, and it was great. It was one of the best episodes of Strange New Worlds. But she apparently is going to be writing the new show that they're going to be launching, which is about Starfleet Academy, which is a show that virtually nobody asked for and nobody wants. So I think that's part of the reason they're doing it. And the other thing is, is that the last season of Picard, um, as many people know, they did the whole thing with Seven of Nine being a captain of the next generation of Enterprise and had the next generation crew. There was uh, LeVar Burton's daughter was on there. And the fan response was immensely overwhelming, saying, we want a legacy Star Trek show. It was massive and got to the point where Paramount actually had to say, listen, we've heard you. We've heard you people. We know that you want this show. Please stop bugging us about it. We, we understand that you want this. So I have a theory that because right now Paramount is kind of strapped for cash as far as the Paramount streaming service goes. And they only have so much money out there. And they're doing this, um, Michelle, I think her name is Michelle Yao or whatever. Michelle um, they're Yao. Doing, yeah, they're doing a show for her. And then they're also doing the Starfleet Academy show. Neither one of these shows anybody asked for. But they were successful with Strange New Worlds. People were like, hey, when they did the Discovery episodes, the second season, or I think it was the second season of Discovery, where they brought in Captain Pike and they did, uh, you know, the Enterprise was there. People were like, yes, this is awesome. We would like to have this captain pike enterprise so paramount went okay we'll give you that and it responded and people loved it and the show is great and it's doing really well so now the legacy thing comes along and people were like we want that show give us star trek legacy the characters are already there you've already seated how the crew is going to work we like the characters it's pretty much set to go just do that show and at the time they weren't planning on doing legacy but paramount is in a situation now where they need to keep fans happy to keep subscribers to that service and they're cash strapped. So what I think they're doing is I don't know this for certain. And this is purely theory on my point, but I think a, they're getting rid of it because that one girl is going to be going off and writing in the new show and B they need the budget to make another star Trek show that people want. Because if you're a streaming service with the streaming wars going on right now, Disney's going through the same thing. Everybody's trying to get those customers to their streaming service. And the only way that you do that is give people product that they want. And everybody wants Star Trek Legacy to happen. Well, and since they don't have the budget for it, I think they're going to be like, okay, what can we, where, what fat can we trim from where to give us the budget so allow us to make this show? And I think that might be what they're doing is trying to cut as much fat as they can from the Paramount Network to come up with money to produce this Legacy show to get subscribers to their service. There's, that there's be... just a few, few holes in your theory. Um, okay, I'm fine with that. One, animation has the lowest production value. Like, Correct. I it is, that. I'm going to go out on a limb and say for what it costs to produce one episode of Brave New Worlds, or whatever the... Strange New Strange Worlds, New yeah. Worlds um, that is probably half the season budget for Lower Decks. So gotcha, you have a but it's still money. But you have a product that is costing you, in the grand scheme of things, not a lot to put out that has a fan presence and has and gets views, but you're going to cut that to take a gamble on new shows. It, it just doesn't jive. Um, Your theory is correct, and I do agree with that, and I also agree with that what I'm saying could be bullshit because if you have a successful show on your network that people are subscribing to to watch, and Strange New Worlds is a very successful show, the fan base has already started a campaign to try to keep it around. 
So yes, I will agree with you there that you're calling me out on that, and you are probably. I'm not going to argue with that. Your 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 argument makes a lot of sense and is very sound. Continue. I mean, there are some names in the cast. Dennis Quaid's son, Randy Quaid. So there's him. Uh, Funny G- as hell too. Yeah, he's hilarious. Uh, Jerry O'Connell's on it. Um, so I mean, there are some names, but it's just one of those things where it is very easy to make animated shows. First of all. You can record the cast recordings anytime, anywhere, and almost never is it done together. Um, So it's real easy to, if people are working on other projects, you can schedule a day or two of studio time to have them record all their lines, and then it's done on the back end. Yeah, just it it just seems like it's a misstep. It, It seems like, I don't think anybody at Paramount knows what the hell to do with Star Trek. Like that is the other thing that they I are absolutely. I feel like they are honestly throwing spaghetti at a wall to see what sticks. Um, this is what's frustrating because they don't need to. The fans are telling them, "Hey, this is what we want." You know, this is, and that that's the difference between the Star Trek and the Star Wars crowd. The Star Trek crowd is like, "Listen, you guys have made some stuff that's really crappy. You want to make us happy? Give us this." Whereas the Star Wars crowd, that toxic fan base is like, no, everything sucks. Disney ruined everything. No matter what Disney does, Star Wars is going to suck forever. Doesn't matter how good it is. Doesn't matter what it is. It's going to suck. No matter what you guys put out there, we're going to criticize. Everything you know is wrong. Yeah, pretty much. Yes. Um, Whereas the Star Trek community is like, all right, listen, we because the Star Trek community has had to deal with this for a long time. There's been great Star Trek movies and really shitty ones. So the community, the Star Trek community is more like... Okay, that sucks. We don't want that. Just give us this. This will make us happy. We know you can do this. Can you just do this for us? And um, Paramount being run by suits, you yeah. know, it's a different environment. That that's the thing. It is the suits ruin everything, but they do. I think what I that's love That's why we get movies like Madam Web. <laughs> Oh God! It just made my eye twitch. You haven't seen it yet. I know. <laughs> and lucky. I, uh, yeah, uh, but what I love about Lower Decks is the fact that it is. You always in all Star Trek, it is the utopia. Everybody is on board with the utopia. Everybody is working towards the utopia. And nobody is selfish unless they're the villain. Nobody has, like, nobody says fuck. Nobody swears because it's just like, we are the utopian. We are all working towards the utopian vision. And that honestly breaks the universe for me because there are normal people in the Star Trek world. And mm-hmm. and Lower Decks shows normal people in the Star Trek world. Like, the people who have to do the shit jobs on the starships, and you know what? Just get to complain that, you know what? Sometimes I hate doing the shit jobs on the starships. Um, Like, somebody's got to clean all the Riker spooge out of the holodeck. Like, it just... Mm -hmm. And they acknowledge that the the foremost purpose of the holodeck is for people to fuck on it, which also I love. Uh, That is the thing that I like about the show as well. Yeah, it, um, it's it's people have flaws. In all the Star Trek shows, nobody has a flaw unless it's plot relevant. Nobody has just like like there's not just the one guy who's like good at his job, but like has a di- is a dick. Here's the other thing that I like about Lower Decks. I I again, I am a fan of all sci-fi and I respect each category of sci-fi for what it is. I can't compare Star Trek and Star Wars because they're apples and oranges. I'm not going to compare Star Star Wars to The Expanse because they're apples and oranges. But here's the thing about Lower Decks that made me like the show. As quirky and as funny as it is and as how and as much as they make fun of it it makes fun of itself. It still is Star Trek. It still has yes. that overall feel of what Star Trek is. And that was one of I didn't want to watch it. I was like, I don't want to watch a show that makes fun of it because it's not going to, you know, I like Star Trek because of what Star Trek is the same way I like Star Wars because of what Star Wars is. I don't, I don't compare the two. Yeah. So when I was watching it, I was, I, I, I rewatched it reluctantly because you kept bugging me about it. And I said, you know what? Sure. I'll watch it. And then when I watched it, I'm like, this is really funny. But it is still Star Trek. In the end, it still it still fits into that universe. 
And the fact that they were able to do live action on Strange New Worlds and make it fit, even in that context, it still worked in that episode. And and you know, there it, there is likely going to be a crossover the other way in the last season because they've said they're going to cross over the other way. So now that they're it's the last season, it's going to happen in this season. Oh, that's going to be great. It's, that's going to be awesome. Yeah. Um. Now, I. If they're not going to give us a show, can we have a movie every once in a while? Can we have a street? You know, it would yeah. be great can, to can have we make a lower it, decks we, movie. Yeah, I was going to say, can we just make a lower decks like every once in a while? Just one, like what the BBC does. Like, hey, here's a two hour movie. You know, like, have. Yeah. Yeah. And they've got the network to do it. Sure. That, that would be awesome. I understand that we're probably not going to get the show back. Okay, fine. But there's no reason. Like, Discovery is not a great show. I, I watch Discovery because I'm a Star Trek person. Same thing with Star Wars. I'll watch anything Star Wars it puts out there. I might not like it, but they could put Star Wars shit on a shingle and I'll watch it. I might not like it, but it's like, hey, it's Star Wars. I've waited my whole life for all of this stuff. I'll take the good with the bad. If I don't like it, whatever. I'm not going to go on the internet. I'm not going to whine. I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to fa- put laugh emojis every time something comes up. So, you know... Again, you've got the network to do it. You've got you've got a viable place to put this thing. You don't have to release it in theaters. Yeah. Okay, just don't. We don't need to get rid of this. Discovery, sure, let it go. This show sucks. <laughs> it. I know fo- you don't watch these shows, but you know. Yeah. And I mean, I, I guess I don't really have a lot of say considering I I pirated every episode of Lower Decks. I refuse to pay for Paramount Plus. Um, I did for a little while. Um, I'm about ready to again. I might, you know, but it's kind of hard to sit here and bitch about the content that these people are releasing when I'm not paying for it. You know, it's, it's we're paying the iron price. Yeah. You know, I can't, I can't be there. I can't sit there and be like, wow, this show really sucks. This, so this show sucks or whatever. It's like, you, yeah, you're not, you're not, you're not part of the network. You're not paying for it. Yeah. So, I get that. You know, I really don't have the right to sit and do that kind of stuff. Marvel, oh, yeah. yeah, Disney, I'll I'll bitch about that as the day as long as the day is long because I'm paying for a Marvel subscription. I I'm paying for a Disney subscription every month to watch this stuff. I guess I but guess my problem so. with Star Trek is the same problem I'm kind of having with with Star Wars is like I don't want you to go back and tell old stories. I want you to continue the stories you're already telling. Um, like, I, I, that's what people want with legacy. Yeah, it's like that's, I, that's I, exactly the exactly. The with like I said, I would see, or I would be interested to watch a legacy show just to like, okay, here's all the characters, here's what's going on. Like, and f- there better be fucking Garrick there because Garrick from DS9 is possibly my favorite Star Trek character of all time. Mm-hmm. Um. That's why I like Strange New Worlds. That's why Strange New Worlds works because those characters were kind of, most of those characters were already established in canon mm-hmm. from the pilot episode. So there is a viable story there to tell about this crew that happened before Kirk came along. And I know you haven't watched Strange New Worlds yet, I, but you're not a Trekkie person. I you're not. am not. And that's okay. I get that. I'm not going to berate you for that. And that's the difference between me and you is I will respect all, all sci-fi is equal in my eyes, unless I don't like it. Like me and you have a big thing about, um, I'm a DS nine person though. DS nine is my least favorite star Trek show. I'm going to catch a lot of hate from that, from the star Trek fans, because the star Trek fans are like, that's the best one of all of them. And it was so much better. The first time it was written as Babylon five. That's where me and you differ. I tried to watch Babylon 5. I tried to give it a shot. I just could not get into it. I and just the didn't reason, like the show. the reason I enjoy Babylon 5 is because the characters have more depth. It is, it is not just like... I mean, when you get right down to it, Jordy's defining... Jordy LaForge's defining characteristic is that he's an engineer. Outside of being an engineer, he has nothing. Uh, Riker, he plays the trombone and he's a ladies man, but that's it. Like his, his character is, he is second command of the enterprise, but you go to Ah. Babylon five and the characters are like, Hey, Michael Garibaldi is the, uh, is the head of security. He's also a borderline alcoholic. He's also, uh, done some shady shit in the past and a bit of a mercenary. 
Uh, Susan Ivanova is the second in command of the ship. She's also a latent telepath. She also really hates the Psychor and has reasons why and backstory. Um, Londo. See, Mal- DS9 did a lot of that kind of stuff too. So. Not really. Like Kira. Kira had a lot of character development. Um, but O'Brien. O'Brien is the engineer. And that's what he does. And uh, the only thing he does outside of being the engineer is go to Quark's and play darts with uh, Julian. And that's it. I don't know if I agree with that. I, I, I agree with you on what you're saying with DS9. I mean, not with, with, with Babylon 5, but I didn't watch enough Babylon 5 to really get into it that far. Whereas with DS9, DS9... And I'm not comparing Apple to Oranges. I respect and understand why you like Babylon 5 better. I get it. I just didn't like it. And there's and, and I'm not gonna and I'm not going to I have nothing to criticize about it. I just didn't like it. Um, that's the difference with me with a lot of other people that are like I I'm not part of the toxic fandom of one way or another. Whereas DS9 though was different than a lot of the Star Trek shows because it was much more grittier. There was a lot like Commander Cisco wasn't like the other other Star Trek app. Like if Q showed up and did something, Cisco would have punched him out because he was just that kind of guy. He was kind of an asshole. And the characters in DS9 were much grittier and much darker, and they did have problems with them, and they did have issues and things like that because it was a different setting. It was a different part of the galaxy, and the show was much, um, I guess, grittier. Grittier is the only real word that I can use with it. But those shows, DS9 and Babylon 5, kind of came out around the same time, and I just think it was fate that made it happen the way that it did. Uh, and no, if somebody it was comes the along, fact. It was the fact that. J. Michael Straczynski pitched the idea of a space station show to Paramount to do in Star Trek. Star Trek said, "Hey, we we all we already we still we've got to we want to do another show, but we're not sure what we want to do. But we don't think we're going to do a space station show." So then J. Straczynski went and got funding to do his own thing, and then Star Trek said, "You know, maybe we'll do a space station show," and yeah. And then there were, like, some seriously eerie parallels. Um, I really think that that was all just happenstance. I don't, I don't really believe that Paramount specifically set out to do that. But I don't, have an, I don't have proof. I don't know. So it's a valid argument to make. I will respect that argument. And, and I, will, <laughs> I will respectfully say J. Michael Straczynski is not a reliable narrator. Because J. Michael Straczynski loves J. Michael Straczynski more than anybody loves J. Michael Straczynski. And he is... That's a great way to put it. (laughs) Yeah. And he is very much his own favorite cheerleader. Um, Like, the... His favorite sound is his own voice. Um, I've met the guy, and, like, I love his writing, but he's kind of a douche. Um, Kind of a douche. I, I, you, you are not the first person that I've heard that from or read that about him. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I didn't like Babylon five and if, if somebody out there is a Babylon five, that's great. I'm, I'm glad it did what I'm glad it scratched whatever itch it scratched for you. Cause in the end, I'm like, if I go to, there, there was a picture out there for a long time that had like Babylon five and Star Trek people all sitting on the steps going into this convention you know, and then there was a couple of Star Wars people in the middle of it. It was one of those coexist kind of pictures. Mm-hmm. And really, that's all it comes down to. Like, I don't I don't have the time to, to be I don't want to add to the toxic fandom or the problem, you know, all of that stuff in the world. I try to really stay above it. You know, that's that's why I don't go in and. and oh, my and, God. Speaking of toxic fandom, um, the Warhammer 40K community lit itself on fire recently, and it was... Oh, no. What happened now? <laughs> oh. Um, so, in the Warhammer 40K universe, there is a faction called the Adeptus Custodes. They are the Emperor's Guardians. They are the Watchers of the Palace. They are taken directly... They are enhanced directly with genetic stock from the Emperor. They are the baddest of the bad. Um, they are equal in prowess to like, suppose like depending on who's writing the fiction 
to the Primarchs, the progeners of the Space Marine Legions. Um, in the new Adeptus Custode rulebook, there is a two-page uh, blurb of fiction, and in it, it references a female custodian. Oh, no. And the community I have lost... heard something about this, but I didn't know what the hell it was. I was like, is this really a thing? Are you people really flipping out that bad about lost it? Lost go its ahead. goddamn mind. And I, like, it was the most enjoyable I have ever seen the community disintegrate. Because I play Adeptus Custodes. Like, they were never, they were a part of the world, but it wasn't until probably about six or eight years ago that they became a faction that you could actually play. And even at that, it started out, you could only play it in Horus Heresy, the, like, historical warfare version of 40k. Which I am interested in playing, to be honest. Well, we've had this discussion. Yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't mind playing in that that game. Mm -hmm. Um. So yeah, and and I didn't play them because I had a huge like attachment to their lore. I played them because my twenty five hundred point army was eighteen models and it fit in one transport case. And that is why I'm interested in playing that particular. Yeah. Oh my god, it's great! Large battle game. Um, also. You know? Also, the best part was I had either mathematically lost the game by turn two because they're just there's only a few models. Like if if the dice go bad, it goes bad real fast, and then I get mm -hmm. to drink more. Or <laughs> by turn four, the dice had gone my way, and I've eliminated his entire army. It's real swingy. There there isn't a middle ground, and so it usually meant games went fast, and we got to the drinking faster. Mm -hmm. um so yeah like just that at the community in that game seems a lot cooler the like th there's not the people there are, in, are interested in playing the game and having fun they're not interested in trying to build armies that can break things or yeah it, it's so it's not about i'm gonna spend five thousand dollars on this army you know whereas the the one that we're talking about now it, there's not there's not that much there you know it's yeah. everybody plays space marines or th something like that well so here's the thing is in the 40k meta which is the meta is a term that's given for like the game within a game of like okay you have the 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 warhammer 40k rule set but then you have the shifting balance of which is the most powerful faction uh, so you have guys who are called meta chasers who are the guys who are just like, oh, this Corbrook came out. This faction's the most powerful faction. I'm going to immediately buy an army and play this faction. Uh, so before this Corb or this rulebook dropped, the custodes were the top meta faction. Uh, the last big tournament uh, I went to, Adepticon, Custodes, a lot of people playing Custodes, a lot of the top armies playing Custodes, because at the time in the rules, they were very, very strong. So at first, the rule book leaked, and everybody was upset because they got nerfed hard, because that's how the rules ebb and flow. And then they found out about the female Custodes, and, like, it was watching... Like, I, I don't even know how to describe it. So you have the meta-chasing dude bros who are just like, oh, this isn't my 40K. Meta-chasing dude bros. <laughs> One, I mean, I don't know anything more accurate to call them, but they are, okay. they are the competitive, toxic players. They are the guys who don't care about the lore, who don't care about the, uh, the paint jobs. They are playing these armies because they are the best armies, and as soon as they are not the best armies, they're on to the next thing because winning is the thing for them. It's not about anything other than playing the strongest army and winning. Um, but as soon as there's female... like l l Let's face it. The 40K community skews heavily to toxic masculinity. It is the toxic masculinity male, fa the patriarchal male fantasy. It's like you have uh -huh. the genetically engineered super soldier dudes who stomp their way across the galaxy, destroying anything in their path. And I, this is why nobody plays the sisters of battle. Nah, I mean, people play sisters, but um, that, that's a whole separate argument. So just watching these people who like, only care about the rules, and they're only playing custodes because of the strong army, but all of a sudden now there's female custodes losing their mind. And the hardcore custode fans, like myself, we don't care. We're just like, 
believe it or not, the 40K lore changes all the damn time. Like, like just mm-hmm. stuff gets rewritten, stuff gets moved around, depending on what authors are writing the lore books. The, the active joke is that the people who write the 40K novels and the people who write the 40K rules not only don't talk to each other, actively don't like each other. Because stuff will be written in the books of people doing these cool things that they absolutely cannot do in the rules. Uh, and, like, the rules people are like, well, that's that's preposterous. We're never going to give them rules for that. Um, so, but you would see uh, there were tons of memes, glorious memes. Um, there were uh, people like myself putting up posts in trade groups like, hey, upset the custodes have women in them? I'll buy your army cheap. <laughs> <laughs> like... Honest to God, people rage quitting. Like, and yeah. then, then yeah, it when it's, it, it's, it's like the Budweiser thing. <laughs> oh, it gets far worse because now you have like guys who are making lists of, well, these are the content creators that are the anti woke con- content creators who don't like that there's females and we're going to follow them. And these people are the content creators that are okay with it. And we're going to, we're going to shut them down because they're wrong. And it just like it, now it's starting to get ugly and Warhammer like games workshop has basically been like, uh, yeah, we wrote female custodes deal with it. Um, we're not like they're, they've been almost silent since the release. Um, and that's just infuriated people more. And that's probably the best thing that they can do. Right. They're, they're, this is a no-win scenario. Because yeah. Games Workshop needs to get females interested in this male-dominated hobby because that's the only way they're going to grow market share. And honestly, Good luck with that. And honestly, this is great. Because if this weeds out the toxic people and gets them to go, like, rage quit 40K... That brings in that brings in uh, the ability for people who are okay with it to flourish in the hobby. It's the same thing going on with D and D right now. Is like you have the the old guard grognards who are like, well, D and D is going woke, and okay, no, it, okay, you don't no, like you it, know what? go no, like th- be- that's that's all of this going woke shit is all bullshit. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. It infuriates me. Like, that, that okay, it's, it's not permeating all aspects of culture. It it's is especially not, nerd dumb. Okay, it is not. Let let's put this out there. I don't think wokeness is bullshit. I think saying wokeness that it's like this nebulous term is bullshit. The yeah. thi- the these games, these properties adapting to be more. Uh, inclusive and to show more inclusivity that's not being wokeness that's capitalism that's hey we just need to appeal to a broader broader market share and hey let's bring new people into the hobby that have different points of views because those people will have a different point of view and make the hobby better because they bring stories and they bring an eye to detail they bring different things that make the hobby more unique there's content creators on youtube or on twitch that paint 40k and they paint them in like like marines and pride colors and they look awesome and i love it and if things like this get toxic players to leave 40k um bye felicia right before covid um Warhammer, well, probably a year or two before COVID, uh, 40K transition from 7th edition to 8th edition. And this was a big jump because to that point, the rules had mostly stayed the same um, from 2nd edition all the way to 7th. Like, they would tweak the rules, they would change how things work, but mechanically the game was still the same. The jump from 7th to 8th was a big thing. Um, At that point, Games Workshop had finally been knocked off the top spot of the number one hobby gaming company. Um, They had been dethroned by, um, at the time, I think it was Asmodee? No, somebody else was, whoever was making X-Wing at the time. Like, X-Wing came out, and it just knocked GW off the throne. 
like here is a game that the miniatures are pre-painted you don't need whole armies you can buy a couple of miniatures play the game and have enjoy it and it's star wars Mm -hmm. um so games workshop finally for the first time ever felt the crunch and needed to do something so they came out with eighth edition eighth edition changed fundamentally how 40k played um and in the eighth edition rule book like the first page of the rule book there is this blurb and it said they they made a point to show up a like scene of people playing the game and there was a woman playing the game and like people were like there's no women in 40k but under that there was a text blurb and it basically said hey 40 K's for everybody. Uh, whoever wants to play, they are included in the community. And if you have a problem with that, and I quote, you will not be missed. Games Workshop. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, Games Workshop it's... has kind of taken a hard stance on they want to get rid of the toxicity and make the hobby more inclusive. But you have that old guard who just don't want to give it up. They want to be the gatekeepers. They want to be... See, that's weird to me. And this is kind of the same thing that happened with D&D uh, when 5th edition came out. Is 5th edition was this, hey, we need to make D&D mass appeal. And it was, it was the, a new rule set. It was a new, like, streamlined rules. It was a, pal- a complete palette cleanse of 4th edition. It's like, we're mm-hmm. going to take D&D back to its root. And then what you saw was it became popular. It became so popular that D&D was now in the, like, like you had Critical Role. You had um, Stranger Things. You had D&D being a cool thing. And the only way I can describe it is that, like, normal people want, like, were interested in D&D and wanted to play. Yeah, it, it, and it the broke, old people yeah, were D&D resentful of it. You had these guys who had been outcast and saw their outcast hobby now being mainstream. And instead of being like, hey, this is awesome. This thing I always got made fun of is now cool. They were like, fuck those people. Those people are doing it and it's cool. But when I did it, it wasn't. They should not be in the hobby. And the, you know, the gatekeeping. The hobby will always be better the more people are in it. And until it's also always going to be a place where weirdos, freaks, nerds, misfits, and oddballs like us are always going to be welcome. I don't think it's ever going to lose that corners to it. But I don't understand. I had no idea that the 40K community was that masculine toxicity. But now that you say it, now that I think about it, I don't ever recall playing 40K with a girl or another person on their side of the table that was a female. War Machine and Hordes, yes. 40K, no. I don't think of it. I don't. I can't think of any chick that's gotten into 40K that I know of. I do know a, a couple of women who play. Um, and like I said, I, I know several uh, TikTok streamers who are painters and who are players, um, who are part of the community. And there is a shift. It is a slow glacial shift, but it is a shift. Uh, towards a more inclusive community. And there's been good things about that, that, like, they have now strict... Po- the Games Workshop has taken a much firmer hand in control of, like, the tournament scene, where they had stopped running the tournament scene for a long time, and it was run by a third-party uh, company, to now Games Workshop runs the tournament scene. And there is a absolute ironclad code of conduct there is ironclad rules about what your miniatures can be like literally what you can wear if you're on like if you have the number one army but you're you're wearing a t-shirt that says um you know pussy riot or something like that um they will tell you you cannot be in the top table your spot will be given to somebody else because you cannot be marketed online on a stream. Same thing with Hmm. if you do custom modeling, they have really cut down on that. So there's good things and they're bad things, but yeah, I, I, like I said, I, I'm just watching, watching the dude bros burn and I love it. I love everything about it. Um, yeah, I don't have a place for them in my gaming world either or the world in general to be honest with you i don't know call me woke i guess i don't know i've I've been this way my whole life though so i can't really say that but so 
Now, yeah, yeah, it's that's this is the way they, they they have to do that. Times are changing, people are aging, new people are coming. This is the only way that you're going to continue to get people into it. And the culture now is just different. One of my biggest regrets as a parent is that I didn't get my kids more into gaming. I always wanted to sit down and introduce both of my kids to play Dungeons and Dragons. I was going to do it with fourth edition because it was so mindlessly simple. I'd be like, okay, I'll start them with fourth, get them how it works and go from there. But it never happened, you know, and there's a buddy of mine where he's got two sons and he plays Dungeons and Dragons with them all the time. And I'm very envious of that. I, I really wished that I had been like, hey, you know, I mean, I did some gaming with them. One of my daughters is sort of a gamer, but she's too busy and living life right now to do any gaming and stuff. But she never games with me. And I, I, I always wish that I could have done that. But the thing is, is new people are coming along and, you know, people are it's just a different culture now. I, I don't see a problem with it. This community has always been welcoming of whatever. If you want to be in this community, this, you're welcome to be here. Just be cool. Just respect everybody else for what they are, what they play, and what they do. Um, and I don't like Games Workshop. I've made no secret about that. I think that they uh, – and you've, you've corrected me. You've said they're, they're a tr publicly traded company and stuff, and I get that. But – you know, for the longest time, GW was always just like, we need to get as much money out of these people as we possibly can. So we'll come out with a new rule set every so often. I mean, don't we'll get me wrong. Measures. They are still like that. It's just now in the pursuit of profit. But to be profitable, you have to kind of embrace everybody for the most part. And the danger with that is you have the anti-woke people that are immediately going to cling to that and be like, no, I'm done here. Okay, bye. <laughs> I was going to say, know. I don't have much of in in J Games Workshop's own parlance, you will not be missed. Yeah, um, that's fine. You know, they'll they'll get new people to replace it. But GW, in their defense, I've seen a lot of things that have, they've done right over the last few years. I've seen them come back out with games like Necromunda, uh, smaller squad based games. That was one of the reasons I walked away from GW because to play 40k, you need to to, to have a decent army. You had to feel you had to pay a lot of money. Their models aren't cheap. I don't have the time to sit and paint all of those models. I don't have the time to go out and buy 9,000 Space Marines, you know, whatever Lehman Ross tank or whatever the super killer tank is, orcs, you know, all they all have their stuff. And I don't have the time to buy that and paint it. So, for, and, and they didn't, you know, like Necromunda, you play Necromunda, you buy your gang, boom, that's it. There's your team. Blood Bowl, you buy your team, there's your team. Um, you know, there's a couple of other ones. I can't remember what their smaller squad games are. And it was always, you know, Game Workshop was like, well, we're not going to sell those games anymore because we only make so much money on them. When somebody buys the game, they don't they buy their their gang or their team and that's it. They don't spend more money. And that's all the money we can make on them with 40K. Oh, you got to buy this. Now there's a new super tank. Now there's this. Now there's that. And that tank costs two hundred dollars and that costs, you know, one hundred and fifty. And, you know, so it's nice to see them coming back out with smaller games that you don't have to spend a shit ton of money on, though I'm still pissed about the whole Blood Bowl. Hey, here's our new version. Oh, we're going to make another version two years later, a year and a half later. That's, you know, I'm still pissed about that. But, hey, that's that's I'll get therapy on that. So GW has done good. They, they've made strides to recognize that not everybody has a million dollars to spend on a fucking army. <laughs> I'll stop. I'll quit. <laughs> Go ahead. We interrupt this program to bring you a special bulletin. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I was looking at my Facebook feed, and a news report just came up that Patty Jenkins reveals uh, she's writing Rogue Squadron draft right now. Um, so apparently, Rogue Squadron's back on the menu, boys. Um, there was people such a massive reaction to them canceling that movie that I think Disney was like, hey, maybe we screwed up on this one. Uh, let's and be Disney is starting to do that. Yeah, let's be fair. Uh, this is the Star Wars movie I have been waiting for since the 1990s. Since oh, you the Star Wars Expanded Universe came out. Since the Star yeah. Wars Rogue Squadron novels came out. Since the Rogue Squadron comic book came out. Like, I have wanted, like, a Rogue Squadron something. There was talk in the late 90s they were going to maybe do a Rogue Squadron TV show when, like, as just something to do with the Star Wars license. I don't know how real that was. It was just something that was talked about in like Starlog and all the other magazines. 
but mm-hmm. god damn it, give me Rogue Squadron. Give me X-Wings. Yeah. Give and me... I want Patty Jenkins to do it, yeah. too. She's the only person that, I re- well, outside of, of the other two, yeah. you know, she's... You know that that or Bryce Howard. Bryce is Bryce really, Howard. Really yeah. good Star Wars. <laughs> it just, you know, her being one of the only or the very very few people who like knew George Lucas personally because her dad's Ron Howard and she like yeah. hung out. Um, she's yeah, a double I, threat. Bryce... She can act and she can direct. Plus, again, what, this is relative to what we're talking about. I do think there needs to be more female sci-fi oriented directors like the first wonder woman it had its flaws but it was a pretty damn good movie and it was it was done by a woman and with a woman star in it so it all worked the only thing that really messed that movie up was warner brothers coming in saying hey we gotta you know the suits came in we need to have this battle here you you could tell where warner brothers stepped in and said no we want this in the movie we want that we want to do this with it yeah and you know it's i have no I've got no problem with Patty Jenkins or Bryce Howard being in the Star Wars universe because they're they really are Star Wars fans. They get it. They understand how it feels and how it should be. And there was such a backlash about the whole Rogue Squadron thing not happening. That was one of the things where people were like, you already have a, a toxic fan base for Star Wars, probably one of the most toxic. And they're going, no, this is no. You you already pissed us off. Why did you do this? Why, why did, did why you, did you copy why did you, us with this? Why movie? did you take us? What did you give? Show us the one thing we yeah. wanted, and then you took it away. Yeah, and so I think. Um, well, they've already announced. I, I think they're doing it with Star Wars too. I know they're doing it with Marvel. They have. They Bob Iger has said we're going to do two star two Marvel movies a year, and three shows a year. And that's all that we're going to do. And they want to cut back and they really want to focus on the quality and the writing and the presentation. Because when they do that, like with the Loki season, the Loki series, season one and two, when they really just sit back and concentrate on the storytelling and the quality of the product, it's really good. Anyways, just, yeah, just give us the Rogue Squadron. You don't, don't tell us you're going to do this and then not, because that was the one thing that everybody was like, okay, cool. Yeah, we're in for this. The problem is, is it going to be the Rogue Squadron that everybody wants? So there's two ways they can go with it, and I have a feeling they're going to go with the latter. Um, so one is you do a Rogue Squadron in the interim years between uh, the new trilogy or the the original trilogy and the sequel trilogy. Um, so it'd be in the Mandoverse. Is yeah, what it basically would be along the, the same timeline as the Mandoverse. The and other lots of room for that in there. The other option is you do it post sequel trilogy and it's like okay uh the republic's been like the republic navy has been wiped out the republic government's been wiped out uh the galaxy is kind of in anarchy we need to get a team together to like get things under control so you get old man wedge and you get uh Poe Dameron, and you make a new squ- and you get the team back together, and you make you make yourself an X-wing rogue squadron, and I am just as okay with that as I am with option A. That part of what you're saying, I think, will work because if they were to do it kind of like a Top Gun kind of thing, like the last Top Gun movie, they brought Tom Cruise back to train the new guys because he was the guy with the experience, and you could have Wedge and Tilly's fit into that role very nicely in the Mando Mandalorian universe. Um, Cause the old pilots are aging out. I don't think Poe Dameron would come back. I don't think Oscar Isaac would come back because of just how, how messed up they did with how they, how they handled his characters in the uh, last three movies. So you remember we've, we've had this argument before uh, of we have. The, when Disney shows up your, your doorstep with a dump truck full of money. It's a lot harder to say no. And I can't argue with that because Oscar Isaac did come back to do Moon Knight, but they gave Oscar Isaac a lot of creative control. And he was one of the executive producers of Moon Knight, which is why I think one of the reasons why I think it was so good. Yeah, Oscar Isaac could come back to Star Wars because of the whole Moon Knight thing and him directing it. And uh, he had a lot of control in Moon Knight. So therefore, he's on good terms with Disney for them, to, if obviously, to allow them to do that. So it's basically just, you know, one wing of Disney to the other. It's like, all right, we'll go down to that office over there and talk to those guys. So, yeah, it's possible that Oscar Isaac could come back. I, I really don't care if he does or not. Like the whole Ray movie that they're coming out with. Great. Just 
just write it good. Just put some heart into it. Make it a decent movie. Get all of your ducks in a row. Make make a good quality product because that movie's already. I think it's already doomed to fail. The community's already like, no, we don't want Ray. We're done with Ray. Blah 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 blah. It's like it's not her fault. You know, just give her a good chance for a movie. Yeah. So you um. I'll I'll take the lead on this one since I've been doing it mostly. You went to Disney and you actually went to the Star Wars park that I went to as well, which I was super excited that you went and you got to see it in person. So tell me what you what your experience was there. Um, so for the two hours I got to spend in the Star Wars uh, park, it was great. So one of the reasons it's been so long since we recorded was first uh, at the end of April or no, the beginning, end of March, I was in uh, Chicago for Adepticon. Then in the beginning of April, I was in Disney with my daughter's trip. I was a chaperone for her, the Wind Out Music Boosters trip to uh, Disney World. Uh, and then at the end of April was PenguinCon. So this is kind of the culmination of all that. But yeah, we had to be at the school at 3 o'clock in the morning one day. Uh, we flew an overnight flight got to Orlando about noon and then our first day we went straight to the uh the Hollywood Studios park. Uh so that's where Star Wars Land is. And then we were there for one day, then we were at Epcot for a day, and then we were at the Magic Kingdom for a day. Um so yeah, is as, as soon as I got there, that was what I wanted to do, but because I was a chaperone, I had to tag along half the kids in my chaperone group. And they were a bit indecisive about what they wanted to do, which meant uh, I did not get a lot of control over what I wanted to do that day. Uh, So I did go to the lightsaber shop. They did not have the lightsaber I was looking for. Um, Oh, which one did you want? Dude, I wanted Balin Scores lightsaber. Um, Like, like that is honestly, I think, one of, like, it's because I like how his is more of, like, a longsword hilt, and he fights more, like, a European style. Um, I really love his lightsaber. Uh, They did not have that. Um, They had a couple others, but none that really seemed cool enough that I desperately wanted to get them. Um, Melina wanted um, one of the lightsabers, so I got her... Uh, Ezra's lightsaber from Ahsoka. So not his one from the show, the one he had in Ahsoka. Okay. Uh, Canis Jarrah's <laughs> lightsaber is pretty cool. I, I That was the only runner-up that I thought I might get. Um, oh, you should have got it. Yeah. But... The only time you're going to be there for foreseeable future. You should have you should have got it. So but the, hey, I don't know. The thing is, like, first off, it was fucking expensive. Uh, we're mm-hmm. talking like three hundred bucks to get the oh, yeah. the blade and the the uh, the thing, and I realized like, man, there's better ones than these on the internet, cheaper. Um, so I think probably probably Christmas this year I'm gonna buy myself a lightsaber. Um, then next day we were at Epcot and Epcot was fucking amazing. Um, did, well, did you go on the the Rise of the Resistance ride? No, the only oh. ride, the only Star Wars ride I got to experience was Star Tours. Oh man! Yeah. Okay, let me ask you this. Um, I remember I told you the story about how when we walked up and saw the Millennium Falcon in person, there was my, there was me, me and the wife, there was another guy, and then there was a, a couple from Japan that was there, and. Um, we all saw it and like we all like we didn't even know each other. We all just stopped and looked oh, at dude. this thing in awe. I took so many pictures, like from every angle of just like this is this is a thing my entire that has existed in my mind my entire life and here is a and physical one to one scale object of it. Um, I am so happy you got to experience that yeah. and you understand what I was saying when I saw it. Oh yeah. Like it's, <laughs> it was amazing. Um, and yeah. it's like going to Mecca. <laughs> yeah. It really, it really kind of was. Um, and they just, they just announced today. I was a little sad. I didn't get to see it or like this week. They now have the free roaming droids, um, mm-hmm. from the, the one video game, Jedi outcast. Um, mm-hmm. but they, first the star Wars celebration month, they, they finally came out with them. So I didn't get to see those and I definitely am planning a family trip back. 
um, because I didn't get to do a lot. Um, mm-hmm. But then the next day we were at Epcot, and, and like I said, Epcot was just an amazing experience. Um, again, I didn't have to be with all the kids in my group, so I ended up staying the day mostly with uh, my daughter. Uh, but I still had to be by chaperone rules, which means... Every single person I see with their T-shirts, they have the Around the World drinking game, and they're checking them off, and I can't fucking do it because I'm a chaperone. (laughs) Dude, in the Mexican pavilion, they had a churro, tequila, and caramel milkshake. Ooh. Like, everything about that sounds amazing. Like, yeah, like, like I need yeah. it. And I almost, I almost broke the rule. I was in line. And then there, it was like, we were getting, we were getting lunch. So I was like, Hey, can I, can I get that? Maybe just without the tequila in it. Um, and they're like, the ice cream machine isn't, we haven't started the ice cream machine yet. It's like, God damn oh. it. Um, oh, dude, we went man. on the we went on the Guardians of the Galaxy coaster, and Melina has never really been on a roller coaster, um, so she was kind of scared. Um, and I didn't know that was a roller coaster. I thought it was like one of those motion rides. Uh, so because we get in there, and you're in this like what I love that Disney gets is making the waiting an experience. Um, yeah, that's the cool. Th- that's one of the cool things about the 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 Rise of the Resistance ride. Yeah, but go you, ahead. You you get into the you get into like the building, and it's set up that it is a uh, like a cultural exhibition from the Nova Corps. So there's there's little props from the movie. There's screens playing like videos of people. Uh, one of the like Nova Corps officers that's doing the guided tour is Terry Crews, so it's awesome. Um, and then like all the actors are recording parts for like being interviewed for these like Cree news programs. Uh, the only voice that I don't think was there was they had somebody else doing Rocket. Um, it wasn't Bradley Cooper doing Rocket. Uh, but everybody else was, was them. And then you go into this area and you're supposedly going to get transported up to a, a Nova Corps warship. And they hurdle you into this room and they the, the, there's lights and then you can't see it because it goes dark. But all the walls rise up into the ceiling and you're in a set. Um, and then... So there's a, the piece of energy or technology that they're using to transport you gets stolen. So you've got to go to the escape pods. And so uh, these doors open, you go down these hallways and they make it look like you're going down an escape pod. And then you get to the room and then it's you see it's a roller coaster. And while it is a roller coaster, what we found out was all the cars have independent 360 degree movement. Oh yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. That's the same way the rise of the resistance ride works where they're all moving around and they're all going in different places and stuff. Oh yeah. They're like, so this was, so your this celestial being stole the piece of technology and the guardians of Gal- the galaxy are sending you to go retrieve it. So you get on the, the you get on the train and you go up this hill and there's an LED wall and you're you're watching this video and you're in this place and you think you're going one way and then all of a sudden the ride moves backwards complete like with magnetic acceleration so there's like zero there's no like waiting it's just you start moving and then you're into this ride and while it's going, it's a dark ride, so you're you're kind of in the dark. You can't see what's going on. There's these set pieces. They're playing a soundtrack. Um, the first time we wrote it, they were playing Tears for Fears, Everybody Wants to Rule the World. So mm-hmm. my daughter and I are like, she's terrified, but she's like excited. And I'm screaming the, like, I'm screaming the song lyrics as loud as I can. And while you're doing it, like, the whole roller coaster will tilt sideways and show you a set piece that's like on the ground. It's like, oh, it's the moon. We're going past the moon. It was amazing. And then we get out and my daughter's like, I was so scared. I was crying. I almost peed my pants. Can we do it again? Yep. Good. And Good. it's like, we absolutely can do this again. They have three different rides there 
that are like that. The one that you went on, there's a uh, ride over at the back end of Epcot, which is the Ratatouille one. And then they have the Rise of the Resistance one. And, oh, I'm sorry, four. There's also one inside a man's Chinese theater that, they, uh, that they've converted over to where the magic of movies or something like that, where there are all those little cars that move around. And those are all controlled by AI. And each car knows exactly where the other one is and where they're going to go and stuff. It's really crazy. So we did that. We rode that twice. Um, and then we made our way around the pavilions and that was great. Like I'm supposed to be on a diet and I ate my way through like four or five pavilions and everything was amazing. Uh, it, honestly, I was actually surprised the food wasn't that expensive. Um, I will say the first day when we were at the Hollywood studios, um, after we had been t after we had done like our first group check-ins the uh the uh, people in charge were like okay well you can break off into smaller groups right now and like some of the kids were oh well let's go to this place to eat and let's do this and i'm like i don't have to be around you guys cool you guys do whatever you want i'm going to go get adult food um <laughs> and they have a hollywood brown derby at, in there and i ate there and it was a, it was delicious um and then where did you go to the Hollywood Brown Derby? So, oh yeah, I, okay, yeah, I know where that place is. That's the one place I haven't tried yet. Yeah, uh, they used to have one at MGM Casino. My brother-in-law worked there, and my wife and I would go every year for our anniversary, and then like Valentine's Day we'd go. Um, and they had I love the food there. It's really it's like ridiculously expensive, but it's really good food. And let's see, what else did we really do at Epcot? Oh my God, we went to the we went to the German Pavilion. And apparently, like, they have, like, a Werther's, like, confectionery shop with, like, candy and pastries. And I got this snickerdoodle sandwich cookie, which I believe is the most decadent thing I've ever eaten in my life. <laughs> it was two snickerdoodle cookies, like, sandwiched into just a solid half inch of buttercream frosting. Like, like I, I think I hallucinated at some point, and Wilford Brimley spoke to me from say, beyond the Wilford grave. Brim it's like, oh, God, Mufasa coming down, except it's Wilford Brimley in the sky going, Good morning. I'm Wilford Brimley, and I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes about diabetes. I got a shake that was something like that um, over in Tomorrowland when we were there for Halloween. They had these special Halloween-only treats, and... I, I, the wife's like, do you really want to buy that? I'm like, yeah, I got it. And it was this caramel apple, like ice cream float thing that it had big giant pumpkin ears. It was, it was just ridiculous. It was just massive. Like here's sugar in a cup with more sugar frosted in sugar and it's frozen, but it's sugar. Here's yeah. sugar. Um, Oh God. Oh God. Man, and, you, and you were probably like, Oh <laughs> yeah, dude. And, and then we got to the Japan pavilion and, like, they have this massive, like, store with all these cool Japanese things. And I bought a lot of stuff there. Yep. Um, that seems like a place you would. Yep. I know exactly the one you're talking about on yep. the right-hand side. Oh, yeah. Yep. Um, and, and also, uh, I fell hard for the pin collecting because there was all the cool pins. Um, like, that was a thing. Uh, I got the Loki pin because um, they have, like, these pins that have, like, all the characters from a show. And it'll be like a little scene, and they had one for Loki, and I'm like, I absolutely have to get this one. Um, I got the pin that I got last time. I was super, it was super off the wall corny. I only found it at one store, and I got the pin of Vincent from the Black Hole. I know you showed me that, and I'm a little sad yeah. I never saw it. Oh man, I was I was like, I gotta get this one, and the wife's like, Okay, go ahead. I'm like, No, you don't understand. I'm like, I'm I'm like one of the nine people in the world that really liked that movie, and. The oh, woman's dude. like, yeah, this is the only place in the park you can get that pen is here. And I'm like, mine. <laughs> I didn't even think twice about so, it. So, and then, then we went on Space Mountain when we went to the Magic Kingdom. And my daughter was, like, not having that. She said it was it was too rickety and I was getting smacked mm -hmm. around. And it's like, who cares? I've wanted to ride yeah. Space Mountain since I was, like, five. I don't care. Mm -hmm. We're riding Space Mountain. Did um, you go on the Tron ride? No, I didn't. Because, like, oh my you. my God, John. Dude, all of the really this is stuff that you I, I, okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I First of all, you could you couldn't do a fast pass like you had to do a fast pass and then you had to pay a second fast pass fee just for the Tron ride. 
That is shady as hell. Um, yeah. Otherwise, you had to enter a virtual queue and they would let you know when your assignment was to get there. I yeah. got my notification that we were, our place was ready in the virtual queue at 8.15 at night. And Man. we put in at like 11 o'clock when we got into the park and we found out about yeah. it. Because I had actually, I knew in Magic Kingdom we were going to be, because um, the, the kids got to march in the parade like down Main Street. So I knew we weren't going to have as much time that day so i paid for fast pass that day so we could ride a couple of rides and actually not have to wait in line forever and i have to say like the only ridiculously long wait at any of the rides other than tron in magic kingdom was freaking the jungle cruise really oh my god there was a wow. two hour wait to get on the jungle cruise um and wow. then when we tried to fast pass it they're like well there's no fast passes available till six o'clock at night what the crap? Uh, you we, know why? I understand why. Because when we go down there, we always stay at one of the Disney resorts. And part of what that does is that allows you, if you're at a Disney resort, it either allows you to get into a park earlier on some days or stay later on other days. Mm -hmm. So there were days when we went there where we would stay later and the park would clear out. And if you were staying at a Disney resort or hotel, it was the park was substantially more emptied for you to be able to get on stuff. Last time, like my favorite ride there is the Haunted Mansion. I always try to go into the Haunted Mansion because I always see something different every time I go in that ride. Now it's going to be Haunted Mansion and Rise of the Resistance. But um, when we got there, I was like, okay, it's Halloween. I'm in Disney. I don't know if I'm ever going to be here again on Halloween. I want to go into the Haunted Mansion. That is the one thing that I want to do besides the Star Wars park more than anything in the world. I want to go into the Haunted Mansion on Halloween. Unfortunately, the ride kept breaking down and stopping every so many minutes, which was fury infuriating. But I think we waited maybe an hour tops to get into the Haunted Mansion on Halloween, which was super surprising to me. But yeah, the reason I mean, a lot of these rides you can't get into is because they let people into the park early and they get those fast passes and they get them booked up. So by the time the regular public comes in there you're only getting into the ride after everybody else is either booked oh, yeah. and now in the morning or in the afternoon. They've got the they've got the apps where you can like you can pre-book for meals. Like if you want to eat at the sit, sit to any of the sit down restaurants, you better have yeah. that booked before like noon because otherwise everything will be booked up for the whole day. Um, we book them 6 months out. <laughs> yeah, I uh so we rode Pirates of the Caribbean like 3 times cuz the wait was like negligible and it was inside and it was air conditioned. Um, yeah, it's a cool ride. Too. Yeah. Um, let's see. We didn't go on the Haunted Mansion. Um, what else did we do in the Magic Kingdom? I think we just kind of walked around and we were like, did they were really the Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs ride. The mine ride, I believe it's 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 um, oh, it was when we went in October, it was a new ride. It was pretty cool. I, I think we only waited in that one for about an hour as well. I was a little sad that I couldn't get on Splash Mountain. Um, okay. Because Splash oh, Mountain, it. yeah, they're rebuilding Splash Mountain to to take yeah. out the really, really offensive uh, Song of the South references. Mm -hmm. Um, and we, the thing was, we were there long days, so we would get to the parks like right, kind of when they opened to the public, and we would be there till like they would do the light show. So I mean, at that point, it's nine o'clock at night. So, I mean, like, by halfway through the day, a lot of the kids are just burnt out. Um, mm -hmm. And, oh, my God. Parents, like, remind your children, Monster is not a meal. Monster is not hydrating. I, I was chaperoning a group. And one of the things they say is like, you got to drink, you got to drink water, you got to drink water, you got to eat, don't, don't do it because it's hot. And we're, in, we're in like Florida, we had just left Michigan where it was 40 degrees and it's 80. Mm -hmm. So I ask one of the girls and it's, it's somebody whose mom I know. And it's like, Hey, did you drink water? Have you, what did you have to eat today? She's like, well, I drank like four monsters. And, and, oh my god! And it's like monster. Wow. Yeah, no, 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 no. Your kids' kidneys are going to be destroyed by the time they're sixteen. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it, it was hilarious because, like, uh, I I had posted some pictures, 
and like there's a we have a facebook group so the parents can see the pictures and i found out like one of the kids that was in my chaperone group um his mom was somebody not only did i go to school with but i was in fact in marching band with um so that was kind of fun and so we did we did all the disney stuff and then we went to you for the next two days we went to universal and universal was I enjoyed Universal. I I would want to do both of them. I don't like Universal is a lot more like the, like to get into the park you have to go through this giant open air mall. Um but like we go there and we're like you have to walk through the Harry Potter place to get on the tram that takes you to like the other islands of adventure park and it's supposed mm-hmm. to be the Hogwarts train. So it basically takes you from one Hogwarts park to the other. And my, my daughter's like, I don't, I don't want to do anything Harry Potter. And then really, (laughs) we're getting to that. Wow. But then we're like walking through the Harry Potter world. And then we get to the other, the new Harry Potter park where it's like the, the Christmas park. And then she's like, well, maybe let's, maybe let's go in this shop. And I'm like, okay, well I got to get something for John Michael. So I got him one of the Harry Potter wands. And then my daughter's like, well, Maybe maybe I maybe I'm not so much over Harry Potter. Maybe maybe Harry Potter's still a little cool. So so it's like okay, we'll do the thing. We 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 both. That's the thing that I want to go back to next. I, I'm kind of done with Disney. I've done Disney so many times. Um, I told the wife, I'm like, I really want to go to Universal. I want to oh, see the Harry Potter park. Oh, dude! And then uh, they're in the process of revamping one of the parks. That next year when it reopens, it's going to be like How to Train Your Dragon, um, <laughs> which. I I unapologetically love those movies. Like I have never ne- watched them. They have an opinion on them one way or another. But hey, again, we respect all nerddom here. I am a grown ass man, and I have not watched the third movie because I know in the end of the third movie they like toothless has to go away, and it's going to be real sad. And I am not, as an adult, emotionally prepared for that. Um, <laughs> so, um, so we we get our wands, um, and we get like. We get the the generic ones that aren't like the characters' wands, and there's a really cool. They're by different woods that are in them, so there's a really cool ebony one. And I'm like, oh man, should I get this one? And then they have one that's the larch, and I or Melina got you because she couldn't decide which one. I was like, we'll get you because you woods what they use to make longbows, so it's kind of cool. And I'm like, do I get the ebony one, or do I get the larch? Because it's a reference to a a bit from Monty Python's Flying Circus that, like, maybe two people on the internet get, and I just think is hilarious. I don't know. I know none of what you're talking about because I've never seen the movies. <laughs> well, no, this was the TV show. So in the Monty Python TV show, there was a... Oh, yeah, I, know, I remember Monty Python, the TV show, yeah. Yeah, so there was an episode where they were doing Identifying Trees, but they only ever did one tree. So it's like the... Today, identifying trees, the larch. And it just shows a picture of a larch. And then they go do other funny things. And it's like, identifying trees, the larch. And like five times they go back and it's only the larch. I'm like, yeah. The only t-shirt I bought on my whole vacation, because I I have too many t-shirts. I never wear them all, so I didn't want to buy a lot of t-shirts. Um, yeah, I'm getting that way too. Was in the UK pavilion of Epcot. Uh, I bought a Monty Python T-shirt. <laughs> that's that says, uh, "Let's not argue about who killed who." <laughs> Did you go into the little chocolate like pastry shop, sweet shop that they had inside the London one? I don't know if I went in that one. I went, like I said, I went in the German one, and that kind of oh boy, um, the German one, the French one. Um, the English one had some cool stuff in it and the, um, the, where the Matterhorn is, the, the, Nor- the, Nor- the Norway pavilion had some really cool stuff too. Um, the, I did no in the Swedish pavilion or the Denmark pavilion, one of those two, like the Nordic pavilions they have. So yeah, there's a ton of frozen shit and it's all the frozen mm-hmm. shit, but then there's like this little building and it says the temple of Odin. And I'm like, mm-hmm. fuck yeah. So we go in there and it's like a little, like a little, like, uh, just, just, I don't know, like museum thing, but it talks about Norse mythology and there's 
like uh, they talk about Odin, they talk about Thor, they talk about Freya, they talk about Loki. Um, I was sad they didn't mention Freya's giant chariot pulled by cats. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't, and they didn't mention like all any of the other Asir, so like they don't mention Baldor and all that stuff. Uh, but yeah, I just thought it was like a little cool thing. Um, let's see. And the, yeah, I mean, like, uh, we, we wrote, uh, like I rode the Spider-Man like motion ride in the, uh, that was kind of fun. We're in the, cause you're in the, like, uh, they have the Marvel comics Island of adventure, but it's mm-hmm. very specifically in universal. They have the comic book license. So it's the comic book characters in comic book costumes. So like the X-Men come out and they're in their like classic nineties costumes, which because they had just dropped the uh, X-Men 97 co- or cartoon were like, everybody knew them again, mm-hmm. like blue suit Cyclops and classic Wolverine. I got my picture taken with like Captain America because fuck yeah, it's Captain America. Um, and then you go in the Jurassic Park world, and they have a meet and greet experience where you can meet Blue the Velociraptor. Yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> okay. like there that, that was there was just it was just eerie silence. But yeah, um, so I got a lot of great. No, pictures. I was waiting for you to continue. Go yeah, ahead. I was gonna say I got a lot of great pictures. Melina mostly enjoyed herself and wasn't a wet blanket. Um, I when, especially when we got the uh, the pictures with the dinosaur. I'm like, okay, like they they have you take your pictures and then it comes behind you and it'll start sniffing on you and they tell you like at a certain point we're gonna tell you to run and we want you to run and we want you to run because it's gonna look good on the camera that we're taking video of for your on your camera phone. So I get up there with Melina and I'm like, all right, these people are like walking away at a leisurely pace no we are going to like look terrified and run because and do you know why we're going to do that she's like because it's for the bit because it's for the bit (laughs) uh they they have like the like one of the fake bruces like uh by the restaurant that's supposed to be from jaws and you can like take your picture with your head in jaws's mouth so i did that Overall, it was a great experience. I want to go back, but I think I want to go back with my family and like spend a little more time and maybe take some more breaks during the day. Because yeah, like I said, by the end of the day, I was I was toast. I think I've got one more trip down there, and me. I, I just don't want to do because we've been to Disney five times now, and this last time I went, it, it, it was because when you go to these theme parks, there's a lot of walking. Like you don't just like. You oh gotta fuck walk yeah! To get everywhere, um, like to go to, to go to the, the 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 Star Wars park, you got to cut all the way through Disney Studios because it's way way in the back corner. And by the time you get there, you're like, <sighs> <sighs> let's put it this way: before Adepticon, I bought a new pair of tennis shoes, and these are like Skechers that I specifically buy for work. Um, they've got kind of a a no slip tread. And I love the shoes, but they wear out after, like, the tread wears out after, like, six months. I have the exact same problem. I yeah. love the Skechers that I wear, but there's no tread left on the bottom of them. So, yeah. I and re- it's, like, I replace so them. comfortable, though. I replace them every six months. Um, I oh. wore these to Adepticon, and I wore these to Disney, and by the time I got done from Disney, like, they were just gone. So that was the story of me living out, like, all the things I wanted to do at Disney since I was a kid. Like, I went to the Enchanted Tiki Room. I sat through the Tiki uh, show. I rode Space Mountain. Um, I did not get a Dole Whip because I don't like pineapple. But I ate fucking churros. The churros were delicious. Um, Yeah. 10 out of 10. So I'm much. Good, I'm glad. I, I just wish you. Oh man, if you could have rode the rise of rise of the resistance. Oh, because the, there was a special. And I still. I don't want to ruin it for you. I want you to. I want you to experience it so bad. There's a part in that ride where these doors open up out of nowhere, and you're just like, oh, "Holy shit!" Like, yeah. And every like, and the ride, everybody just kind of stops and looks, and the the people that work in the ride are like, "Come on, carry on, go, keep going, keep going." You know, they're kind of yelling at you, because if they don't, you'll just sit there and stare, and your eyes will pop out of your head, because it's like, 
holy shit, I feel like I'm really here on yeah. this particular thing. And yeah. you didn't get to experience that. Ugh. So I don't want to say what it is because I, I I want you to go back and I want you to, you, you know, you're going to be like, I rode the ride. I know what you're saying now. <laughs> right, right. So now that we've talked about my uh, Star Wars experience, uh, it is a time-honored tradition. Uh, last weekend was the Kentucky Derby. I had my Derby Day cocktail. It's time for another round of Weed Strain Racehorse. <laughs> Yes, last week was the uh, Kentucky Derby 2024, and every year, as is tradition here, and we've kind of fallen behind in some of our traditions. I brought some of those up the other day in private. But um, the one thing that I really like to stick with every year is a game that we like to play, which is commonly played all over the internet, called the Weed Strain or Horse Name. How this works is I will give John two names, and John has to pick which was a Weed Strain and which is a Horse Name. Most of the time, 95% of the time, I try to stick with horses that have raced in the Kentucky uh, the Kentucky Derby. Sometimes I've fallen astray from it if I find a couple of really interesting names. But this year, for simplicity's sake, we're only going to stick to horses that have raced in this year's Kentucky Derby or previous Kentucky Derbies. So are you ready to rumble, good sir? I am ready. I think my record stands pretty solidly at like 50-50. Yeah, and that's fine. That's not a, that, that's not a bad record to have. Yeah. So let me pick two names here. All right. So we're going to go with first name, California Chrome. Second name, Kaboom. Which is the strain of cannabis and which is the horse name? Ooh. California Chrome or Kaboom? Oh, man, that's a tough one. I'm going to say, I'm going to say uh, Kaboom, Weed Strain, California Chrome Horse. You are correct, good sir. Oh, yeah. Out of the gate. Good, Gotta... good start. Out of the gate right off of the bat. So uh, we're going to go with next one. The next name is going to be Honor Maria or Dynamite. Honor Maria, Dynamite. Horse strain or cannabis? Oh, man. I feel like Honor Maria has got to be a horse name. Like, that is, uh, that seems like it would just be the lamest name for, like, a, a, a weed strain ever. Uh, and plus a weed strain called dynamite. I, I, I'm going to, okay. Anna Maria horse, dynamite weed. That's two for two. Good, sir. Two for Very two. Oh Very yeah. Good. The next one is going to be intense holiday and blue moonshine, which is the horse intense holiday or which is the weed strain. Is that a cannabis strain or is that a horse name? Ooh, this is a tough one. Um, Okay, I'm gonna go. I'm. <laughs> I'm gonna go. Uh, holiday weed strain. Uh, Blue moon horse name. Intense holiday is the horse. Blue moonshine is the cannabis. Oh, all That's right. It's okay. It's okay. We're still going strong. Still, We're still going strong. The next name is going to be Wonder Haze, followed by. Big Bazinga. <laughs> Wonder Haze and Big Bazinga. Oh, man, I feel like Wonder Haze has got to be the weed strain, but I'm like, is is it is it too baity? Is it too baity that the haze would be the weed strain? And I, I have done this. I have specifically looked for horses that have names that sound like cannabis strains and vice versa. I've, I've actually tried to throw some ringers in here before, so. I'm going to go... Big Bazinga Horse, uh, Haze Weed Strain. That's a correct one, sir. All right. Three for one, so you're doing pretty good here. Um, next one is going to be Mr. Nice and Samrat. Samrat. Uh, it's so weird. Neither of them sounds right for either. Just let the force guide you. Go with what's <laughs> in your heart. Don't overthink mm. it. You'll ruin it. I'm going to go you know, just... Sam Sam Rat Weed Strain, uh, Mr. Nice Horse. Incorrect, good sir. Oh. You are still three for two, though. Okay. It's okay. We got this. Next one we're going to go with is Hopportunity and Crazy Train. Hmm. Hopportunity sounds like, an, like a douchey IPA. It does. I will agree with you there. <laughs> oh, really man. That, I, I was going to say, now that's the next iteration we're going to have to do of this is a douchey IPA or weed strain. 
Um, that might. Yeah, I, I could try that. I, I'll see what I can do. Oh, all Opportunity right. Opportunity or crazy train. Crazy trains the horse. Opportunity's the weed. Incorrect, sir. Damn You're it. Three for three. Oh man. You are. You are. You are becoming the gray Jedi here of the horse train or weed name. So we're gonna go with the next one. Is uh, let's see here. Let's see if I can try to throw some kind of a weed, uh, weed strain. We're going to go with West Saratoga is the first name, and the second name will be El Jefe. Oh, El Jefe has got to be the weed strain. It's got to okay, be. that was a little easy. It'll <laughs> be that one. <laughs> I'll, I'll the Jeff. On one. <laughs> All right, we'll go with final two, unless you want to keep going. No, no, well, final two, because right now I'm four for three. So as long as, long as I don't. As long if if I get this one, I'll go in the higher win, and if I lose it, it will still be I'll still be at fifty fifty. Okay, so we're gonna go with romping goddess, or, or, let me see here, romping goddess or domestic product, romping goddess or domestic product, which is the horse, which is the which is the horse, and which is the cannabis. I want the weed strain to be ramping goddess. Like, like, I want that to be the weed strain. Like, like, if if I'm smoking weed, I want to be romping with the goddess. So, okay. And then, what was the other one? Romping goddess or domestic product? Domestic product's the horse. Romping goddess is the weed. Incorrect. Oh. Romping goddess is the cannabis. Domestic product is the horse. I purposely hunted that one down because I felt I was giving you too many easy ones. No, but no, no. That, that's what I said. I, that's what I said. I said, rom- I said romping goddess was the weed and domestic product was the horse. Oh, okay. Then you are correct then. I'm sorry. Yeah. I just heard you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because that's what I said. It's like so, I, want, I want romping with the goddess to be the weed string because if I'm smoking weed, I want to be romping with that goddess. So four for three. <clears throat> Not bad. Not too bad. Oh, not too shabby. Well, we'll have to work out. You have to find some weird ones for next time. It's getting. I can do that, but the problem is, is we are. I don't like to step too far out of the Kentucky Derby thing of it. But if you're okay with me doing that, there are easily tons of horse train name horse names out there, and well, I was going to say endless supply of of cannabis names. How cannabis products get their name, nobody quite understands. But I'm hey. going to guess they start <laughs> smoking that product, and then they're like, yeah. <laughs> Um, but <laughs> I was going to say any of the triple crown, like, like, so the, what's the triple crown? It's the Kentucky Derby. Um, Ignis. yeah. And the, like those three races. Um, I don't know what to throw. I'm not a horse person, a racing person guy at all. So neither <laughs> am I, which is why this game is fun. <laughs> I am, however, a cannabis person and I've made no secret about this, but yeah, I, I can totally understand that. So all right, well, we're approaching the two-hour mark, and we, we still have, like, a bunch of stuff we wanted to talk about. So I think we're going to save that for another episode. But uh, hopefully we'll get back to doing some, some more uh, recording on the reg. Um, Rojan, what do you have going on? Right now I'm trying to get a couple of shows down for Project Archivist. I just moved the studio into a different room in my house and reset things up here. Um I've been doing a lot of guest appearances on other podcasts, um, but I've got at least two shows that I've got set up ready to go. It's just a matter of sitting down. Like one of them, I want to do the Biblical Jackass show with you. Oh, yeah. Um, I got that one going. Um, I've I've got some stuff that I want to – now that life is beginning to settle down a little bit and things are beginning to smooth out, I've got some ideas for shows. But I've been saying that for the last year now, but things just keep happening. So (laughs) – but I, I, it's like I told you um, the other day, uh, I didn't want to do my show until we got this one taken care of first, and then I can put more effort back into doing some of my stuff and getting my stuff fired back up again. But uh, that's pretty much it. That I'm still running the Cinema Labad Facebook group. Uh, we're still doing the movie meets up and stuff, and hopefully, oh yeah, it's about to be the, out, um, outdoor movie time again. Yeah, I was just say the drive-in, the drive-in theater will soon be open up under, while under construction. Um, uh, I've got the, you know, the backyard's pretty much getting reorganized. I, we had our sewer line bust over the winter time. So they had to come and trench out my backyard. I think I've talked about this. The backyard looked like the surface of the moon. We've kind of got that all smoothed out, put fresh dirt, put new grass seed down. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm almost done rebuilding the fire pit. And then once that's done, it's going to be like, Hey, come on over here. You know, we'll just deal with the grass growing as we deal with it. Cause all of us are missing the whole out, outside thing. 
So hopefully I can get the the cinema the bad driving back up and running again and you know get off of the because right now we're currently just doing everything through Discord on the internet and watching movies together and we're kind of like hey it's like getting warm outside and you know we we need to get back to doing this again we're all kind of craving it. Oh man, yeah, and the that's weather, pretty much it. The weather was beautiful today. I hung out clothes. I had the day off, so I was day drinking and reading my book. It was. It was gorgeous outside. I worked on my backyard. I, I'm in such a fierce race to get this backyard back together again so we can start having people over here to watch movies, you know, with the projector in the backyard next to the fire. That It's like every minute of time that I have that I'm not occupied. It's not raining. I'm outside working on it, building the fire pit and putting this here and getting the ground smoothed out or putting this here or whatever. So, yeah, it's uh, it, it's nice to have summer come back around again. It really is. Yeah. And as always, you can find us at the Old Nerds Drinking Facebook group. Come for the podcast, stay for the memes. Uh, and with that... Which you've been slacking on lately. I will I will call you out on the air on this. You used to be... I I had to work really hard to keep up with your memeing ability. So I got, a, it's like, I got a confession to make. Like, I'm in a couple of private meme groups, and I have been getting some choice memes, but I've, I, you're right. I have not been sharing them in the Facebook group. Uh, there's... One group I'm in that does memes every Friday, and so I go there and I'll harvest, and then there's another group that does meme Monday, so then I take the stuff I harvest from the other group and put it in that group, and then I harvest from that group and put it in the first group on Friday. But, I, oh my god, I have so many memes on my phone, and there's some yeah, dark yeah, yeah. ones in there, because one of them is the dankest meme group, 18 and over, and there are, there are some dank memes in there, sir. <laughs> that was one thing. That's the one thing that our, our Facebook group, like even the people, there's people in our group that don't even listen to the podcast. They're just in there because we do two things. We post very intelligent, intellectual, nerd-oriented stories about things that we're interested in. We don't get into the whole slam Star Trek, Star Wars slam. We don't slam any, as we've said here, we don't slam anybody's nerd culture. And the other thing is, is that we post some really next level nerd oriented memes. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, like, like I said, thanks to the custodies meltdown. I have a lot of like really relevant custodies memes, but that's about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. You need to you need to jump back in and start. All right. I will make I, will I don't make, mind carrying the weight on my back. It's fine. But hey, you know, I will make I, a I concerted effort to, to start to start putting some memes back into the old nerds drinking Facebook group. Yeah. Cause I am nothing. If I am not a meme Lord, uh, there, there's a be... me, there's a meme I used to have. It's like, you can say I'm not the best looking. You can say I'm not the brightest, but you cannot say that my meme game is not on point. I mean, you, you are my brother, Anakin. And now, you know, I have the high ground and it doesn't feel right. I, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm like, I'm like, I'm posting memes and John's not posting anything in here. And it's like, oh man, I just, what's up, man? You want to talk? Are you okay? Yeah. <laughs> is, is, is everything good in meme world? You know, I'm here for you if you need me. <laughs> uh, Anyways, go ahead. Wrap the show up. <laughs> all right. And with that. End of line. Over? Did you say Over? Nothing is over until we decide it is. Was it over when the Germans bombed Pearl Harbor? Hell no! German? Forget it, he's rolling. And it ain't over now. So, what's the plan? Take car, go to Mum's, kill Phil, sorry, grab Liz, go to the Winchester, have a nice cold pint, and wait for all this to blow over. Might as well write them off. Close up the bridge. Let's get out of here. Close it up. Lights out. Where are you headed, cowboy? Nowhere special. Nowhere special. I always wanted to go there. We're going streaking! All right, come on, nothing to see here, please disperse, nothing to see here, please.